हरे कृष्णा दंडवत एम आई ऑडिबल ओम ज्ञान तिरंध से ज्ञानांजन शलाकाय चक्षुरोन्मलतम ये ना तस्मै श्री गुरवे इन महा सो ग्रेटफुल टू बी हियर विथ ऑल ऑफ यू टुडे एंड आई बी स्पीकिंग ऑन द टॉपिक ऑफ हाउ टू सी द करंट कोरोना क्राइसिस from a spiritual perspective today also is uh, raman krishna pro mentioned to me that it is the appearance day of the dts is place which also are the dts of burn county currently so best wishes and prayers to him and to all of you in your new blossoming community and <clears throat> i'll talk today in three parts i'll talk about basically science spirituality and society and how these three can work together in offering relief to humanity <clears throat> in the bhagavad gita krishna talks about perception in the three modes basically krishna is uh, arjuna is facing a crisis at the start of the gita and it's a crisis where a huge war is about to be fought and then he feel that how can i fight against my own relatives how can i kill them how can i cause their death so with that thought in mind he's not ready to fight now krishna answers arjuna's question at various levels but the most most relevant for us is that our for our discussion right now is how krishna talks about the three modes of material nature and how to perceive within the three modes so the krishna talks about knowledge in the three modes and then he talks about intelligence in the three modes so knowledge refers to how we take in things from the world and intelligence refers to how we act in the world so the way krishna defines gyan and buddhi are gyan is related to the gyan indriyas buddhi is related to the karma indriyas so 1820 20 to 22 talks about the gyan indriyas and the gyan we acquire from them and 1830 to 32 talks about the karma indriyas and how we learn from how we act in the world using our intelligence so let's look at perception in the three modes and how that can shape our perception of the situation today now let's begin with 1822 which talks about perception in ignorance sometimes the word the word prabhupad uses the word knowledge for that a knowledge can be a little confusing word because knowledge refers to not just what we take in it also it also refers to what we know so knowledge in ignorance can seem a little confusing so specifically what krishna is talking about how we perceive things so perception yat krishna bade kasmin karye saktam hai to kam atatvartha dalpam cha tatam samudharatam so he says yat krishna bade kasmin that when i see one thing to be everything that is knowledge in the mode of ignorance to krishnavat ekasmin so we see one problem or one one thing as everything that means we see one side of the problem as the complete problem or one problem as the total total problem this is knowledge in the mode of ignorance the knowledge in the mode of passion is krishna says prutakve na tu yad gyanam nana bhavan prutak vidhan vetti sarveshu bhuteshu tad gyanam vidhi rajasam so he says that where we take in where we see things ha oh, see we equal the material to the real we look at the physical reality and we think that is all that is there to reality and there is nothing more that is knowledge in the mode of passion and beyond that knowledge and goodness is there where it is said that <coughs> krishna says that <coughs> when we avibhaktam vibhakteshu that when to sarvabhuteshu yenaikam bhavam avyam ikshate avibhaktam vibhakteshu tadgyanam vidhi satvikam is we see the imperishable spirit one spirit underlying all the diversity of matter that pervades the world that is knowledge in the mode of 
uh, goodness. So what does this mean? This means that uh, in terms of our current situation, we are experiencing a lockdown, not just in America, but in many parts of the world. India <coughs> is possibly preparing for a similar shutdown and given India's huge population, so it has to be done more voluntarily than legally imposed. So yesterday was a trial run for that. So now when we see this crisis, it is, it is revealing, it is shocking that we have a whole world being brought down by something which is microscopic and invisible. The Srimad Bhagavatam says, Padam Padam Yad Vipadam Natesham. So, in every step there can be danger. So, with the coronavirus we can say, Sparsham Sparsham Yad Vipadam that with every touch you know, we might touch some surface and then touch our face uh, or we might touch someone and touch ourselves so so there could be danger with that and uh, <clears throat> that's why people are being recommended don't shake hands oh, instead we can use the traditional indian namaste to greet each other so the idea is that there is a great danger right now and while this great danger is there <clears throat> when we look at one thing and make it into everything that means that we just see this danger and become paranoid about it then that is unhealthy <clears throat> so if we have when we look at the world we have we perceive things based on <clears throat> certain assumptions we have certain assumptions about how things work and then based on those assumptions when we pursue things we arrive at certain conclusions and based on those conclusions we come up with certain explanations of what is happening so a c e now we think we, when we work according to assumptions come to certain conclusions and arrive at certain explanations we think we are acing the test of life. We are aces. A-C-E. But what happens is, sometimes those foundational assumptions get challenged. That we live, you know, maybe a couple of months ago, nobody would have conceived that the whole world, world could be brought down to a standstill. The extent it has been brought down just by one microbe. So we live with the assumption of security, of comfort, of prosperity, of strength and then based on that we arrive at certain conclusions. Okay, this is how I am going to live and within, within the normal course of our life if we face some challenges we arrive at certain explanations. Why did this challenge come and how can I deal with it? But it is like <clears throat> say if we are in the ocean and we are in a boat and there are some, the boat gets shaken a little bit. That's uh, okay, we understand the boat will get shaken. But if we find the boat completely capsizing, just turning over completely, the disruption is much more. If <clears throat> we are staying in, a, staying in a house, maybe a wooden house and somewhere in a forest in a cabin for some time visiting in a retreat and the wind shakes it. It's, it's, a, it's uncomfortable to feel our house being shaken by the wind. But if an earthquake comes from below and it just de destroys the very foundation of the house, then there's nothing left. So then it is far more disorienting. So sometimes for us, when we function in life, some of the challenges in life are like storms coming and shaking us a little bit. But some problems are like the quake coming below. And when the quake comes below, it just shatters all our conceptions. So, and then the disorientation can be far greater. So to the extent, if people have lived with the assumption of comfort and security and prosperity and uh, such things, then this can cause much, much greater problems. It is normally, whatever situation comes in our life, the extent of the problem is caused depending on the underlying assumptions that we have. 
most of the world today is in the modes of passion and ignorance in the mode of ignorance we perceive one thing and make it into everything so there is uh, there are people who are who are, are germophobes they are so paranoid if anybody cuffs near them not even in the time of corona but in normal time they just want to send that person far away they want to anyway because they are afraid i'll get a germ and such germophobes in today's times are are getting even even greater panic so now if that one thing oh i just want to avoid germs i just want to avoid germs i just want to avoid germs that becomes the sole focus of one's consciousness then what happens see we humans are more uh, biologically and psychologically we are geared to face visible tangible challenges we so we have souls who have lived in um, who, who have in the previous lives lived in animal bodies and now we have come to the human body so the, in the jungles there is survival of the fittest and if a deer sees a lion it has to run so that is you now we have the fight or flight response but when it comes to invisible challenges then the, where do we be in a fight or flight kind of situation if we can't see a germ so some people can become paranoid because of this so now it's not so much the situation alone that causes the reaction but it is our underlying assumptions so based if i have the assumption that germs are the greatest danger in the world of course presently they are a huge danger but if that is the assumption with which i live then i might arrive at a conclusion that so there's nothing i can do about this so let me just live in complete social isolation and now social distancing is required today but if people become paranoid then they just can't function so we need to be if we have a pendulum we could say one extreme would be constant fear and paranoia paranoia is basically a persecution complex so paranoia is the idea that somebody is constantly afraid somebody, somebody is out to chase me somebody is out to get me and people live in perpetual fear so one extreme would be paranoia if you consider pendulum and the other extreme would be nonchalance it is a big ado much ado about nothing there's no problem at all we are just making unnecessary ado about things so that would be the second extreme now we need a balanced response so what i'm talking about is that based on the three modes how our responses might go a haywire so in general whatever situation we are in life there is some things in our control and some things not in our control in the mode of ignorance in tamoguna we underestimate our capacity to control things in the mode of passion we overestimate our capacity to control things in goodness we estimate rightly and in transcendence we not only estimate rightly but we also see spiritually so now with respect to the corona virus situation if we are in the mode of ignorance we underestimate our capacity to do things that means we just go into paranoia like, oh everything is filled with danger and just person lives in in say fear consciousness in corona consciousness now of course with the daily news cycle dominated by news about corona it's natural that that will be in our consciousness but if that is all that fills our consciousness we might end up fearful so fearful that we can't do anything at all so that is one extreme where just that corona completely consumes our consciousness then that is unhealthy see we we may have to live with fear but we don't have to live in fear to live with fear means to acknowledge that yes there is danger and i have to be aware of it but live in fear means that we are aware of nothing except the danger and if we try to live for too long in this fight or flight response kind of state we'll get completely exhausted so that's perception in the mode of ignorance 
the perception in the mode of goodness sorry in the mode of passion is characterized by overconfidence overestimation of one's ability to control things in this situation what happens we think that we can do whatever we want that we have the capacity to deal with situations and we become overconfident so at this stage nothing will happen to me this is all this is just exaggeration and people just go on nonchalantly with their lives without taking any precautions at all so people party and now of, of course some parts of the world it is legally not allowed but other parts where it is legally advised but not mandated there are many people who just go about their lives as if nothing is a problem so that is the other unhealthy response where the nonchalance there's no danger at all the nature of the world is that there are dangers at all times but at the same time at certain in certain times certain dangers can be more and if those dangers are more then uh, one has to be more cautious so when ram was in the ram was sentenced to the uh, to lanka sorry was sentenced to the forest to exile at that time ram gives a elaborate description of uh, the when sita insists that i want to come with you ram elaborately describes how dangerous life in the forest is and his purpose is to deter her from coming he says you will be much safer in the city now of course in ayodhya also the panda the, the ram had experienced danger in the sense that they had been betrayed by kaikai and mantra but still from a physical perspective he felt the danger was much more in the forest and when they were in the forest ram and lakshman would always be both cautious uh, to take care of sita they would never leave her alone as much as would be possible and when ram was fighting with the demons at janasthan uh, then he or the demons of janasthan came to attack him then ram said that you stay with sita he told sita uh, lakshman you stay with sita in a forest and i will take care of i'll deal with the demons so the idea is that there are situations in the world when dangers are more and depending on the particular kind of danger that is more particular kind of caution is required so when sita was in ayodhya that specific kind of danger of say some demons coming or some some predator some carnivorous animals coming and attacking that would not be there so much in the city so intelligence prabhupad says in the 10th chapter purport intelligence means to see things in their proper perspective so there are certain times when certain dangers are heightened and we cannot go we cannot just be nonchalant and think that okay this is how it is i don't care this is all just a big uh, big exaggeration there is a danger so now if we consider these two extremes paranoia and nonchalance in between is we could say caution now to be cautious we have to be conscious it's like when we are driving okay if i am cautious should i should i speed now should i go slowly should i try to take overtake the next person now if to make all these decisions cautiously first of all i have to be conscious and while we are driving on a road you now it's uh, there are multiple aspects to our consciousness first of all we have to be conscious of what is immediately ahead of us but that's not all we have to look further ahead and be aware okay if way ahead we see a signal coming and uh, there are many cars which have been uh, standing over there then uh, although we are significant distance we may start breaking right away or we are also have to be conscious of say what are the lanes on the side is anybody coming going to come in from the lanes so when we are conscious we are conscious our consciousness is capable of taking in many many stimuli and while we focus on one particular stimuli <clears throat> so now with when we talk about consciousness that to be cautious we need to be conscious and now what do we need to be conscious of that brings us to the mode of goodness in the mode of goodness it is said that it is said that sarva bhuteshu yenaikam bhavam avayam ikshate avibhaktam vibhakteshu tat jnanam vidhisatvikam sarva bhuteshu yenaikam that in all living beings 
there is an imperishable spirit. Avibhaktam vibhakti issue. In that sense, although all living beings are different individually, but still they are, they have a shared spirituality. So this means that our bodies are virus prone. Our souls are virus proof. And understanding this dynamic, that our bodies are virus prone and we have to deal with them. We have to be aware of the danger to them. But at the same time, our souls are virus proof. We have a core that is indestructible. So I talked earlier about our assumptions, conclusions and explanations. So when we have the assumption that the material level of reality is only reality, that either we think that everything is in my control or nothing is in my control in passion or ignorance. But when our assumptions are more aligned with reality, reality is multi-level, there is, there is material and there is spiritual, and the spiritual is indestructible, then that gives us a foundation of security. That, yes, this danger has come, I have to deal with the danger, but at, at my core, I am indestructible, my loved ones are indestructible, and we have faced many dangers in the past, and we will face this danger also. So, avibhaktam vibhakteshu tajjyanam vidhisatvikam. So what does this mean? I talked about in the mode of goodness, we understand, we are able to estimate rightly what is in our control and what is not in our control. So our, our, we understand that the soul is and the spiritual level of reality is indestructible. The body is destructible. So with respect to the body's dangers, we need to be aware of those dangers and deal with them. So, I, uh, so now what does it mean dealing with those dangers? I said I'll talk about science, spirituality and society. Now, there are, now this is largely a crisis that at a level of science, medicine, we are looking for medicines that can minimize the effects of the infection while it is there and looking for medicine that can cure or vaccinate us. So we could say it is in the arena of science. So now it's in the arena of science, but everybody can use any particular situation to prop up their own ideology. <clears throat> so recently, somebody sent me on WhatsApp a, a photo which said that you now when uh, every year people give this much donation to churches, to mosques, to temples, millions of dollars. But as soon as the coronavirus comes, the temples close down and the hospitals stay open. They said if we had given that much money to, to hospitals instead of to temples, it would be much better. Well, <clears throat> whenever any two things are compared, you know, comparison can often be a tool for emotional manipulation. Now, why compare hospitals with temples? You could compare hospitals with, say, with sports. The amount of money that is spent on IPL, you know, if all that money had, if instead of spending all that money on cricket, <clears throat> then we could have made so much scientific advancement. Or why IPL? We have Bollywood. If all that money had not been spent, if so every movie that is made, millions and millions of dollars are spent on it. So why spend that money over there? So the idea is that there are different problems and there are different solutions for those problems. And it's not that one is in com competition or comparison with other. In the Bhagavad Gita itself, we see this, uh, <clears throat> we can call it as distinctive magisteria, distinctive areas of influence. Before the Bhagavad Gita was spoken, Arjuna was there on the battlefield ready to fight. But then he became confused. He heard the Bhagavad Gita and then he fought and he won the war. So when he won the war, uh, did he win because of the knowledge of the Bhagavad Gita or did he win because of the knowledge of archery that he had learned from Drona and had mastered thereafter? The two are not in competition. The two are not in competition. The archery knowledge was what he practically used for fighting and the Bhagavad Gita knowledge was what, what he used to direct his life's understanding of why he's fighting. So broadly speaking, spirituality tells us 
science is a tool for operating in the world and science, whereas spirituality is gives us the reason for our existing and operating in the world so we could say with a generalized sense science answers the questions of how spirituality answers the questions of why and in our tradition there is no comp no necessary competition between the two we have ayurveda as a as a ancient and esteemed body of knowledge and ayurveda although it is portrayed in it is practiced in a theistic context ayurveda doesn't say that you just uh, go to a temple and your your problems will be healed ayurveda is itself a science and says okay this is the imbalance in the body this is the medication that is required so there is research for that so the material and the spiritual are not seen as in competition with each other and uh, everything has its own place and understanding this is important so is it that <clears throat> the hospitals today are uh, there is a particular kind of crisis and for this crisis it's a medical crisis and naturally the place where the medical crisis is healed is the hospital now when arjuna had to learn archery that was not the time he heard the bhagavad gita there's a place for everything and this kind of false equivalency or misleading comparisons they're simply tools for emotional manipulation so now again with respect to science and medicine specifically we could perceive it in the mode of ignorance in the mode of passion in the mode of goodness so of course science and scientific study is a product of knowledge it's 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 only scientific knowledge it's a product because we have studied and we acquired knowledge but how we view something we can view knowledge through the mode of ignorance so if somebody starts thinking that science is the and medical research and medicine is the only solution that is we we make in the mode of ignorance we make one thing into everything so we make science as the sole solution to all problems well is it really if you consider <coughs> today that the government is even the at a, even if you don't bring anything spiritual still the government itself is uh, adopting a multi pronged approach it's not just science alone there is the economic there is politics the countries are being sealed down sealed boundaries are being sealed now this is this is more of a political measure than a scientific measure it might be guided by science but science is one part of human society one reason why the virus has spread so fast so rapidly so so extensively and so rapidly is because uh, through science we have come to live in a very interconnected world very rapidly interconnected world and there is trade there is uh, tourism there is immigration because of which national boundaries have become very porous in many ways and that's why and the two countries which have the which have been hit the most uh, apart from china are iran and uh, italy and both of them over the last 2 3 years last few years they have chosen to enter into close pacts with china and there is a huge amount of travel and and there's a, there's a significant amount of interaction between the two countries and that's why although neither of those countries are right next to uh, next to china but both of them have been severely affected so it's not just science alone there's geopolitics there's economics there's so many other factors involved and there are multi pronged approaches required for dealing with the uh, dealing with the issue so we need to <clears throat> so one extreme is to think that spirituality can do nothing again going back to the pendulum that this particular skeptical message that that you know what is the use of spirituality science alone will solve the problems well even at a material level we are not depending on science alone we are looking at political measures legal measures economic measures there are so many things which are being looked at so so one is to make uh, to think that science alone is the answer the other extreme would be to think that spirituality alone is the answer so this is an ongoing debate within various religious communities that uh, 
should the religious community the services be shut down should we just have faith in god and with faith in god we uh, if we are doing our devotional activities god will protect us yes god will protect us but one way god protects us is also by giving us intelligence by giving us intelligence it is mattah smritir gyanam apohanam cha buddhir buddhimata masmi krishna says i am the intelligence of the intelligence i give knowledge in knowledge forgetfulness and remembrance so one way krishna protects is by giving us intelligence so when uh, um, prabhupada had come to africa at that time there was a i uh, there's a they for entry into that country you needed a flu inoculation and prabhupada's assistant said prabhupada's servants had not told him about that and prabhupada came and prabhupada had to stay for almost 10 days in quarantine and prabhupada was annoyed even angry by that he said why didn't you he had told his disciples over there why didn't you tell me about this this 10 days got wasted for me so the point is that we have to be aware of practical realities and we have to act accordingly in in japan there was a particular now the word temple is used generically not necessarily as a hindu or a buddhist shrine with this place but uh, there's a temple and there they had the whole community they kept coming kept coming uh, in south korea also something similar happened and people got infected over there um so then so what the point here is that there is when krishna was fighting when arjuna was fighting uh, in the Bhag, uh, in the kurukshetra war he did not think that krishna will protect me and i don't have to fight he used his archery knowledge so there is an understanding so that okay that uh, sp the spiritual does not replace the material If the spiritual does not replace the material, then what does the spiritual actually do? The spiritual. The, I conclude this talk with two, three points, and then we can have some question answers. So, what does the spiritual do for us? Basically, <clears throat> the spiritual ex spiritual knowledge expands our vision of reality, by which we can perceive things properly. this i'll explain in uh, uh, in terms of an acronym act a c t accept commit and trust accept commit and trust so the idea is that whatever happens in our life there are certain things which are in our control certain things which are not in our control so for what is not in our control we need to accept okay this is how the things are right now mm -hmm. and then that some and now what is not in our control what is our control that keeps changing sometimes we are in situations where it's 99% in our control and 1% out of our control so if somebody has somebody has two job offers and he said which job am i going to take now it's largely their decision so but sometimes it's almost less than 1% in our control and 99% out of our control so like say if there is a lockdown now then what we can do is very limited so now dynamically there are times when some things are in our control some things are not in our control and we need to accept that this is the situation right now and once we accept that then we can move forward i think last uh, last time when i spoke there in the sunday feast i had spoken about this we had discussed about karma and the principle of karma so whatever happens in our life there is karma daiva and kala which leads to the phala suppose somebody wants somebody is farming and they want a harvest so there is karma is that they sow they sow the seeds and plow the land then daiva is the rains come at the right time in the right quantity and kala is the season changes till the harvesting season so karma daiva and kala lead to phala karma daiva kala lead to phala all three together so now with respect to this theme karma daiva and kala so with respect to daiva so karma refers to that which is in our control that which we need to do daiva refers to that which is not in our control and that we have to live with 
So I talked about this acronym ACT. So with respect to Daiva, what is not in our control, what is destiny, we need to accept it. Mm -hmm. uh, then what is in our control, karma that we need to commit to it. So accept what is not in our control, commit to what is in our control and trust that this too will pass. The takala in the material world, nothing is permanent. And that means that even the greatest of dangers, the greatest of calamities, they are not permanent. So we need to trust that not only will this end, but through this something good can come out. If we, if we move to, if we strive to stay connected with Krishna, strive to move closer to Krishna, then something good can come out of it. So what does spirituality offer us in such a situation? Spirituality offers us a whole picture of reality. Science is a tool, it's at this stage a very important tool for dealing with the, the situation and we need to use that tool. So for example, with, the role of science would largely come in commit. Commit means those researchers who are actually doing research, they do that in a committed way to find out some vaccine or cure for it. Those medical health, uh, health healthcare providers are there, they work in a committed way. <clears throat> we as ordinary citizens, we work in a committed way to take precautions so that we don't we don't uh, uh, unnecessarily become infected or become agents of infection for others. That's with respect to the commit part. But that's only one part of the solution. Why one part? Because you know, we have to look at the whole picture of life and how do we deal with that? So we need to accept. So the biggest benefit that spirituality offers us is to help us get a sense of the big picture. And within the big picture, we see our place and our purpose. So although the specifics of this danger uh, that has befallen us are unprecedented, <clears throat> at least in recent historical memory, but the principles are still universal. The principles is that there is karma, daiva, kala in every situation that we face in our life. So whatever is our karma, we commit ourselves to it. Whatever is the daiva, whatever the destiny, we accept that. And then with respect to kala, we trust. So now how do we trust? We trust based on understanding that, that ultimately everything is within Krishna's plan. We don't say that everything is Krishna's plan because sometimes bad things happen and sometimes some people because of their carelessness or maliciousness may do some, some terrible things. And when they do that, that is not necessarily Krishna's plan. In the Bhagavatam, in the first canto, in the ninth chapter, when you, uh, when Bhishma is trying to make sense of the sufferings that the Pandavas have gone through, he says, Tasyanu vihito rajan, Tasyanu vihito. That means, it is, he, uh, if you read the translation carefully, Prabhupada says, everything is within his plan. Everything is within the Lord's plan. So Prabhupada doesn't say everything is the Lord's plan. Within means that no matter how catastrophic a particular situation seems to be, we understand that God is still in control and his plan is still operational. And he will guide us through whatever dangers we might face in our life. And we do the best that we can in such a situation. <clears throat> And we move onwards. So everything is within the Lord's plan, and that's why we can trust. So we, with we, whatever scientific resources are there available, we use them to commit ourselves. And the philosophical understanding that we have that enables us to accept things. Yes, there are certain situations we accept not necessarily out of resentment or helplessness, but with philosophical pragmatism. And then with a devotional disposition, we trust. So when we accept, commit and trust, then we can face whatever situation comes in our way. And we'll, when, we tr when we see a problem in this way, then what is our, our chance? Uh, at a physical level, we might decide that we will not, we may not go to the temples. Why? Because the danger is too much. That is what, if you see during the times of uh, Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu asked the Goswamis to build temples in Vrindavan. And although his stronghold, his base, or most, most of his followers were in Mayapur, were in Bengal, 
he did not ask any of his followers in Bengal to build temples. Now we don't have uh, major Gaudiya Vaishnava temples in Bengal per se. There are holy places, but they are more like home shrines or small temples. Why? Because at that time, the Islamic ruler who was there, Nawab Hussain Shah, he was very brutal. So what they did was, Harinam Sankirtan was the way they connected with the Lord. Because at that time, <clears throat> that is most pragmatically available. So the principle of devotion is never to be ad ad abandoned, but the forms of devotion can be adapted according to time, place, circumstance. When Chaitanya Mahaprabhu sent uh, send, uh, Rupa Sanatana Goswami to Vrindavan, at that time Akbar was ruling over there. And Akbar was a relatively liberal ruler. And thus, at that time, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu encouraged them to build temples over there. So Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was also very pragmatic and in terms of he was very very firm in his devotion but at the same time he was practical, pragmatic in his implementation. So if a particular form of devotion leads to certain dangers or certain excessive dangers then we might not necessarily practice that form of devotion. But we don't abandon the principle of devotion. The principle is that yena kena prakarena manha krishna niveshe somehow or the other fix the mind on Krishna. So what we are doing right now, having an online uh, class, this is, we are finding a principle, we are finding a way to implement the principle of devotion while accommodating, ac while accepting or accommodating the, the restriction on particular forms of devotion. So this is not a lack of faith, but this is, a, uh, this is a presence and utilization of intelligence. So devotees have to be faithful, but devotees also have to be resourceful. So if certain forms of devotion are restricted we accept that but if certain forms of devotion can be whatever can be done we commit ourselves to that and we may long for certain things devotees long to build temples for the lord in 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 his birthplace also but now that longing took more than 500 years now we have beautiful temple in mayapur and a more beautiful temple is going to come up so devotees trusted and waited and in due course things will become better so, if we stay connected with Krishna, then Krishna will give us the inner calmness, the inner clarity, the inner confidence by which we can face the situation and do the needful to emerge stronger through it. I'll summarize. I spoke today on the topic of um, how to face the corona crisis. So I talked about science, spirituality and society. I talked broadly in three main parts. First, I talked about the three modes of nature and especially perception within three modes and how that can affect our perception of the current crisis. In the mode of ignorance, we might have paranoia, thinking nothing is in our control and we live in fear. In the mode of passion, we might have nonchalance and think that there's no problem at all. So in ignorance, we over in ignorance, we underestimate our capacity to control. In passion, we overestimate our capacity to control. Beyond the two is goodness, where we perceive properly. And then it um, also in between the two extremes of non, uh, paranoia and nonchalance is caution. And to be cautious, we need to be conscious. I talked about how to drive cautiously means to be conscious not just of the immediate road ahead, but to see the full picture of the road and to uh, adjust our driving accordingly. So similarly for us, uh, I talked about how spirituality provides us the big picture. And then within that, we drive properly. So with respect to science, there can be two extremes. One is science is the only solution and the other is we just practice spirituality and don't bother about any other things. So science is the only solution when some, <clears throat> some skeptics or atheists prop propagate that. It's, uh, if you compare the donation to a temple and uh, funding a scientific research, well, the two are not in competition. Arjuna's Gandhi but archery training and Arjuna's studying Bhagavad Gita, the two are complementary, not contradictory. When two things are compared, often that comparison is for emotional manipulation. Uh, to just that's why don't we compare, say, funds spent on a hospital with funds spent on sports or movies? So the point is, science is a valuable tool, but even at a material level, we are not just using a scientific approach to deal with solutions. We are using a multi-pronged approach: political, economic, social. So we respect the science and its place, but at the same time, 
one extreme is to think that science alone is the solution the other is thinking science doesn't matter we'll just do our bhakti and that itself is a solution we don't neglect the material i talked about how when there was greater danger for sita in the forest there's greater precautions and that's just a matter of common sense krishna protects and one way he protects is by giving us the intelligence to protect ourselves and so then i conclude so so what exactly does if we have to give science its place then what is the place for spirituality in this so spirituality helps us understand the big picture i talked about karma daiva and kala and i talked about accept accept what is unchangeable uh, commit to what is changeable or what is accept what is not in our control commit to what is in our control and trust that this too shall pass and we will emerge better through this so in such situations that commitment is also a part of our devotion but acceptance is also a part of our devotion and we do both and then trust i talked about concluded by saying that as devotees we understand that in life there have been problems and the principle of devotion is never to be abandoned but the practices of devotion can be adapted according to time place circumstances just as lord chaitanya did not emphasize on building temples in bengal because of the hostile uh, hostile rule over there similarly we might have to adjust we might not be able to congregate together in temples at the particular times but we trust the lord and we stay connected with him in whatever way we can and he will guide us through whatever dangers come in our life thank you very much hare krishna so are there any questions or comments yes science and this the there's a <coughs> comment here by satish kalyan science and spirituality are complementary yes they are it's a question mark so i presume it's a question science and spirituality are complementary in the sense that i have a whole another class on this topic where i talk about <coughs> how there is two things one is that everything has multiple levels of causation and science helps us to deal with things at a particular level of causation so <clears throat> now if we consider say alcoholism or smoking so then now science may tell us you know okay if you eat this, this is how your body will get damaged and if you if you consume this particular thing uh, then you have to take this medication so science can tell us but then sometimes people keep doing the same things again and again so science cannot change cannot really change people internally that is where spirituality comes into the picture so in the project of human improvement or in the project of human happiness science can offer a certain certain kind of resources but even the wisdom to though use those resources properly people often don't have it and that can come through spirituality so one way i put it is science can make things better spirituality can make people better and when we have better things and better people then that is a holistically progressive society otherwise we have only better things but not better people uh, then often that can lead to unnecessary problems so that's how science and spirituality are complementary <clears throat> now how should devotees not become judgmental about their fellow devotees responses to calamities <clears throat> it depends we have to understand that everybody has a particular as assumptions conclusions explanations everybody comes with certain set of assumptions and when we come with those assumptions they they perceive things accordingly mm, see in general people who are judgmental they perceive everything in terms of black and white now in between black and white there are many shades of gray but they don't perceive that now why is that it could be because there is uh, <clears throat> some people are just trained some people just they their their vision is such that they can only see things in black and white if if they are told to see the shades of gray they may not be able to see even black and white and they may end up with complete confusion so in that situation uh, if we are to be truly non judgmental then we have to be non judgmental about even about those who are, who are judgmental so 
just as we understand that some people might be very afraid of uh, of particular things so some people might be very afraid of flights why we might if we come to know that oh you know in the in the childhood some of their family members they died in a plane crash and this person is paranoid about flight then we understand from their background that uh, this is why they think like this so similarly some people if we understand their backgrounds we may understand why they are so judgmental if they came from a culture of ethos uh, culture of complete confusion or chaos or they came came from a religion where uh, religious background where their idea was black and white completely then the only way they can negotiate reality is by dividing it into black and white and they just can't see shades of gray so then what do we do krishna krishna and krishna bhakti is big enough that uh, different krishna can accommodate different kinds of people basically the way i define narrow minded and broad minded is that narrow minded people narrow reality so that it fits into the conceptions of their mind broad minded people understand that reality is broader than the conceptions of their mind but some people just have to function in a particular way and uh, in general people are <clears throat> in today's world people are often more intelligent than what we give them credit so even if there are some people who are offering some unhealthy responses to calamities and they might alienate some people but that's how it is people are uh, people understand that in a in an international movement there'll be people of different dispositions that's why we needn't uh, we didn't get too worried if one particular devotee offers a especially unhealthy response uh, especially insensitive kind of response <coughs> so that's one level that's one level of answer to it uh, now how do we recognize the difference between daiva and kala at times when it is difficult to differentiate well we can't really get into that kind of micro analysis basically we have to use our god given intelligence and the dami buddhi yogam tam yena ma upayanti te krishna says i'll give you the intelligence by which you can come to me that means that he will provide us uh, if we if we are prayerful basically in any situation in our life uh, as I talking to continue from the black and white there are certain things which we know we should do certain things we know we should not do now in between these two things there can be there can be other things what we can do or what we need not do so if that is the situation then at least start with doing what we should do and not doing what we should not do and when we show by our actions thus that krishna uh, we want guidance then krishna will give us that guidance maybe internally as a chaitya guru as a super soul externally through some some like minded devotee friends and guides or through other sources of knowledge which makes sense to us so that's why we can't uh, shastra gives us principles and we need to use our intelligence to apply those principles even in the times of even in the bhagavatam itself we don't see anyone just uh, quoting scripture alone and taking a decision based on that when ashwatthama is to be punished in the first canto of the shrimad bhagavatam there are different opinions yudhishthir and draupadi have one opinion bhima has another opinion and it is not that krishna just krishna rajna just quote one verse and they make a final decision based on that they weigh things and based on that they make a decision and krishna is pleased by arjuna's decision so scripture is more of a, a broad compass it provides us a direction not necessarily the specific path that we should follow so <clears throat> we basically try out that means okay by the daiva this much is not in my control now so just like if a person is sick if somebody is in fracture then initially they have to put their arm in a sling and not move at all and then after that they have to start moving now when exactly do they accept it as daiva that now i should not move my hand at all and when they start considering now the kala is over i have to start exercising 
now there is no rigid formula doctors might say okay three weeks or six weeks or one week depending on the uh, kind of fracture but then after that initially there is pain in just staying over keeping the hand motionless and after that there is there is discomfort and pain in moving the hands but we try it out and see what works and based on that we decide what to do and what not to do does that answer the question any other questions so thank you very much shila prabhupada ki jai gaur bhakta vrind ki jai tai gaur premanande